Good morning, everyone. I didn't know how many people would show up today. Everybody usually this time of year travels to be with family at least once a year. This is usually the best time to get together with family for family get-togethers. And um, this time of year can also be a problem with weather, too, but we've got some pretty good weather today. So glad you're here. It's just us. We're not online, so uh, we can have a you know, long, long, no, I'm just kidding. just kidding. Wouldn't do that to you. When you think of people and places and objects, a certain image usually comes to mind. When you think of, you know, a, a person, for instance, you think of, say, President Lincoln, what image comes to mind? You usually think of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington where he's sitting in that big chair with his arms outstretched and, you know, a real, real good likeness of him in that memorial. When you think of a, a particular object, what comes to mind in this country most, first and foremost probably is the Statue of Liberty. You know, you've seen that, it's, it's there, you recall it and you can describe it. It's, it's quite a sight to see if you've ever been in New York to have a chance to see that. And the place, well, the, the place that you probably have an image of that you know is a big hole in the ground is the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's a beautiful place. And to look at that, to be there and to to see and think of the history and how that occurred is, is phenomenal. But you have these images in your mind which you never forget. They're just there. And when somebody mentions a certain key passage or phrase or object or person, that's what comes to mind. Well, this time of year, there is a, an image that comes to mind in everybody's picture up there as to what you think of and what you th see, and that is the picture of Jesus in a manger. That's just simple fact. It, 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 is, it is this time of year that you see that and you think of that. But I want to try to help you to present and look at a little different image of Jesus this time of year, and it's going to take some thought. It's not something that's going to be simple to do, simply because I don't know that somebody's you know, given this type of message before in trying to create a different image of Jesus. But it's just a, it's a time of year that you picture him in a manger because that's what we're accustomed to. It was, a, it was a part of his life. It did happen. He was in a particular place like that when he was born, maybe not this time of year specifically, but it was a part of his life. It was the beginning of his physical life. But I want to try to create this image by using a topic that is going to be a little bit thought-provoking for you to think about. When you look in the dictionary at the word image, it's got an interesting definition. We understand it's a representation of a person or thing. It's a visual representation of, of something in a mirror or through a lens, for instance, an image on a, a camera where you took a picture, you know, with a Polaroid years ago, you had an image instantly in your possession. Nowadays, you can do it on your iPhone. It's, it's incredible what they can do with that, but it, it really is. But the image definition that I really want to focus on today is the mental picture or the idea or the concept of a person or a product that is held by the general public. And I want to use that concept and try to change your image of Jesus Christ when you think of him, not in a manger, not being born in a stable necessarily, but an image of something that's far greater than that. And we could, we could talk about what was the greatest event of Jesus' life, what is the most important event of his life. There are a lot of things. You know, probably we think of the, you know, his death and resurrection as being the, the main part, which is, which is true. But when you look at, at an, an image... To give you a good example of this, and I was thinking of something a few days ago that goes back over the years that created an image in our mind, a product particularly, was the cereal Wheaties. For those of you that have been around a number of years, that was always called what? The Breakfast of Champions. They had sports figures after sports figures after sports figures on the front of those boxes. And I used to eat Wheaties when I was growing up because I wanted to be good in sports. And... Uh, Gave up on that years ago. It just never happened, so I went on to other things. But that, that was something, as, as an image, that was a product that, that created that image, and, and people never forgot that. Today, what, was, what would be the first thing that would probably come to mind as far as creating an image? If I mention the word apple, what do you think of? 
you don't think of an apple that you're going to eat sitting on the desk that you used to take to the teacher to try to bribe to give you good grades. You think of an apple with a chunk bitten out of the corner, and you think of an iPhone or the app or the computer, whatever. That's what comes to mind now. That's the product that has been created. Isn't it amazing how these images change? But, but once you get something that's effective, once you get something that is in your mind, it stays, it seems like, forever. So that's what I want to do with Jesus Christ today, but from a little different point of an image. What image comes to mind, are you ready for this, when I mention the law of God? Well, first of all, you probably think the Bible. Nothing wrong with that. Secondly, the thought that comes to your mind is sin, because we have a problem keeping the law of God, don't we? It's, it's a little bit of a task, it's a chore, it's a, it's a responsibility, it's not easy. And then if you project it a little bit further, you think of what? Death, which is what we're going to be accountable for. But I want to change this image of the law as well a little bit, or this image of, of what God's law is like. If I was to place this Bible up here, what would happen? It's God's word. It's God's law. Nothing. As long as we handle it properly, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. What about all these cars out in the parking lot that are parked out there? You could send your children out there. They could play around them. They could, they could do all sorts of things with them, and nothing's going to happen with them because they're not dangerous. What if I had a table up front here and had several guns on it loaded with ammunition? Well, as long as they're there, nothing's going to happen. What does all this have in common? Well, if things are handled properly and carefully, nothing is going to happen, will it? They're not going to be dangerous. They're not going to be deadly. But God's law, if it's not handled properly, is what? It's deadly. It really is. And we've already encountered that. We deserve that because of what we have done. We know very specifically that sin is a transgression of the law. We know that scripture. We know that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as Paul mentioned. And so that's something that we just have to face with in life. And we know that the wages of sin is death. And so that's what we face. That's what we're going to have to deal with. So God's law doesn't, in some ways, present a very good image to us, does it? It makes us feel guilty. It makes us feel, you know, very worthless in life. You know, Martin Luther was a man who felt very guilty in life, beat himself constantly to try to gain God's favor, to try to to try to make himself be a better person, which led to his, you know, uh, proclamations that he encountered years ago. What was God's law supposed to accomplish and tell us? And what was the image in God's law for us? What was it supposed to represent to us? Well, God's law was supposed to represent life to us. Didn't God say in the Old Testament, I have set before you life and death? and to choose one of them. It was supposed to bring us a better life, good life, but it, it didn't happen. We fell too short of that. Wasn't God's law supposed to be a lamp to our feet as we see in the book of Psalms? You know, we could spend a whole sermon on just Psalm 119 talking about God's law, the wonderful aspects of God's law, how, <laughs> how great it is and how, how much of a light and a lamp it is to us in life and how many people could change their life just by incorporating some of those things into their lives today, even though they have a lot of baggage from the past, they could, they could make some changes very quickly if they would just do some things. In fact, if we could just get people to keep the seventh commandment, we wouldn't have a lot of CEOs leaving office because of problems with too much fooling around. I mean, just one commandment would make a big difference in our world today. And, uh, you know, what a tragedy. What a tragedy that is when people look at God's law and they get this image, you know, well, if, you, if you're meeting with family this weekend as, as a family get together, you know, with, with the one time of the year where people can seem to travel and get together with each other and the great food and stuff that they have, um, and you sit around and you begin talking about God's word and God's law, you're going to 
probably hopefully don't come to blows with each other, but you're going to have some problems with it because people, you know, don't necessarily want to talk about that. But what image should God's law give to us? It should give us a life of holiness, of righteousness, and a life of perfection. Because there's nothing wrong with God's law. It really isn't. So how are we going to see this? Well, I want you to see it through the life of Jesus Christ and to project his life and the image of the law, which is what the title of the sermon is, the image of the law. Because I want you to look at that a little differently. I want you to look at what he is like and what he has done for us. And it's evident in his life. If you would, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I used this scripture a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it's last weekend, at uh, Bring on the Sabbath as one of the scriptures to memorize. And I hadn't even planned to use it in this sermon, and it kind of hit me because it strikes something very vividly in this particular scripture. It talks about what we face within the world today within society and, and the, the things that are taking place around us, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Boy, do we not live in a world where trying to talk to people about Jesus Christ and about God and his word is very difficult to do. It is a world that has been blinded. It is a world that does not want to pay attention to what is here. Like I mentioned, if we could just get people to keep the seventh commandment, their lives would have been changed and, and supported and backed up, and they wouldn't have had the problems that they have. You know, when we look at the blindness that has taken place, when we see what we are supposed to be doing and how difficult it is to, to get through to people, it is really a job and a responsibility that takes a lot of work. It takes not only our effort and our work in, in connecting with people, but it takes God's Holy Spirit, and it takes God actually beginning to call people. And I think the longer you're involved with the body of Christ, you can truly understand that, that it, the Christian life is a calling from God, that God does have to call a person before they can truly change and be different and overcome things in their life. You know, when, when we take... God's law, for instance, and we get rid of God's law because we say it's no longer in effect. You know, Paul said that Christ was the end of the law. Is that a true statement? Yes, it is. But we need to understand what Paul meant by that. I won't have time to go into that. But people take those, those scriptures, those points, and throw that out and say Christ was the end of the law. Yes, he was, and we'll get into a little bit of that later. But it's almost like God's law has, is a natural effect on things in life because in the, you remember it even talks about in, in, in Paul's writings that the Gentile world, which did not have God's law, even has laws that are very similar to God's law because there are reasons for that. It's almost like it's a natural law within things. And when we get rid of God's law, what do we do as people? We create more laws to follow, just our own set of laws. You know, we think of things that we need to do. We think of things that we need to have in our life. And when, when you look at, at some of the simple things that even Jesus said, and he left for us to think and consider. You know, Jesus said, and if we're, if we're going to look at Jesus Christ and, and worship him and focus on him and have this image of him, we would want to do what he said because it's important to him, wouldn't we? And yet man will take things and put other obstacles in the way to focus on Jesus, which has nothing to do with him and to, to try to focus on that. Yet, what did Jesus say the most important thing for us to do to remember him was he said, this do in remembrance of me. And yet, most of society has what? Throwing that out. That's unimportant. And it prevents us from seeing this blindness here in chapter 4, Christ's glory. It prevents us from seeing the image of God because it says here that Jesus Christ was the image of God. And we're going to see that. Back in the book of Genesis, when God created mankind, and God said, let us make man in our image, you know, that statement is a whole lot greater and more depth to it than just in our likeness and appearance to him. The Hebrew word means not only uh, a likeness 
or a statue or a model, but it also has to do with character. And that is the image I want all of us to see about Jesus Christ in relationship to God's law and that character that we are supposed to be developing as people. Because there is an image in our life that we are supposed to try to develop. It's mimicking the life of Jesus Christ. You know, when you look at the book of Genesis, you see in the first three chapters of what God's plan was and what he was trying to do with mankind. And he had started his program and plan in, in those first three chapters to remedy what had taken place in the fall of man and in man's rejection of God. You know, over the years, I've always, always wondered if we had been there, we'd have made the same mistake, unfortunately. We would, we would have sinned. But to imagine a relationship with God the creator, where there was no sin, and that interaction day in and day out with God, because it was a perfect situation, it was a perfect scenario. It's hard to grasp that, because we are so apart from God, just in our own lives, in our sins, in our pulling away from him. But if Adam and Eve had made the right choice, the right decision, salvation for mankind would have been possible without Jesus Christ having to come to this earth and die. I mean, he came to die because of sin. Somebody had to pay the price, and he did that. But when you look at God's plan and what was available and what has had to take place to get man to salvation, where mankind could become in the image of God, eventually, spiritually, to have eternal life, that's what was available to mankind from the very beginning. And it's taken almost 6,000 years to get back to that point, hasn't it? When you look at the rest of the book of Genesis, you begin to see what God was doing with people, and there were people who, who were trying to project that image down through history that God was dealing with. And it was through God's grace, it was through God's mercy that he was able to, to call these people. They didn't have anything special that they had to offer God. You know, Noah, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then when God began to deal with the people of Israel in captivity and, and call them out with Moses, calling out of captivity, you know, God had given them that grace and a chance for salvation, so to speak, or the chance for life, so to speak, just like he has us. He has called us out of Egypt or the world, and he's given us something special to begin to look forward to. But this image that God, of what he was trying to do, this, this change that had to take place through Jesus Christ, which is why Jesus Christ came. He didn't come just not only to give his life as a sacrifice for us, but he came to reveal what the image of God was and the focus of what our focus should be upon him, upon his example, and what he was trying to show God that we were. Colossians chapter 1. Talks again about this image of Jesus Christ. This is such a very important part of understanding that it's more than just in physical appearance because it seems like here in the book of Colossians, Paul was trying to point that out to people. He said, who has delivered us in verse 13 from the power of darkness? And he has from that blindness that we see throughout the world. He's delivered us from that and has allowed us to understand the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. You know, we look at God as being invisible, and you may have encountered people that say, well, if God would just reveal himself to me, I would believe. No, they probably wouldn't. They really wouldn't. But Jesus came to reveal the invisible God through the image of his life and what he lived and how he, how he functioned through life as an example for us. He says in verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he, he did that so that we could understand the image of God. And he has made peace, verse 20, through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself, saying whether they be things in the earth or things in the heaven. 
And you, which were us, sometimes that were alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works, yet now has he reconciled us to God by his life and by what he did in his life. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. While we can't do it on our own, while the things that we do in life and the trying to follow and to live by God's law does not grant us favor in God's sight, we're able to appear unblameable and righteous in the eyes of God because of the life of Jesus Christ and because of that image that he had projected. What was it that Jesus Christ was able to do in his mission when he came to earth? There are a lot of things that involved his mission, what he was going to do. We could probably do a sermon on each one of them. And I went through and was thinking about a few of them the other night. One of them, to sacrifice his life. Not just to die for us, that's, that's another aspect, to die for us. But to sacrifice his life. There were a lot of things in life he was not able to do. Because he had to do certain things a little differently. To do the job he was supposed to for each of us. He had to be perfect. You know, coming down here from, from heaven as, as the God, the creator, with all that power that was at his disposal, and to come down here and live a physical human life was probably a shock to the system. He had not done that before. He experienced it. For us, we know what it's like. It's not very pleasant, is it? You know, we hurt. We, we get upset. We have frustrations. We have to deal with, the, with the, the human mind, which is not easy to do. It's a, it's a constant struggle, isn't it? You know, the Apostle Paul, I, I love the way he wrote it. It's not written the very, the very best, I guess, to understand. But he said, that which I do, I allow not, and that I do, I hate. And, yeah, we can identify with that. You know, we don't like ourselves. But, yeah, we do love ourselves. And then we don't like ourselves when we break God's law. And this struggle, this fight, um, is our whole life. And it's not very pleasant sometimes. It's great to look back and see the changes you've made and, and the corrections you've made. And then you want to just slap yourself silly when something comes back and creeps up on you and causes you to sin again. It's just part of life. Jesus wanted to show us what the Father expected of us. That was an image, I think, in the life of Christ that is very hard to comprehend. But what he did, the way he lived, was what God expected of us. And he was trying to show that to us. And yet, what did God's law point to? It pointed to him. Because Jesus Christ was righteous. It all pointed to him as to how it should be, what is expected of us to do in life. It gave us a proper image of God and of man. That, that, that is, a, is a whole sermon on itself, and, me, and probably even more, in projecting and trying to understand what God has in his love for mankind and his interest in mankind. Because sometimes I, you probably feel the same way. You think of yourself and you think, how can God love me because of what I am and the way I am? With all of our inconsistencies and all of our, our problems that we have. And yet Jesus Christ has this care and this interest in, cre in his creation that was created that he was willing to come and die for us. You know, that in itself as a statement is, is hard to comprehend and grasp sometime. And he's trying to show us and did show us, and boy, does our society need this today to understand what is right and wrong. You know, we've lost that. We just have lost that. You know, as it says in the book of think, Jeremiah, you know, that good is evil and evil is good. We are experiencing that in our lives today in society. And we are going to take heat for it because what we know is right and wrong, the world doesn't feel that way. We are the odd people in society. We are the different people in society. And you are going to wind up getting it for it because people think we're wrong. And Jesus in his life showed that he was loyal to God, which is what we're supposed to be doing. How can we enter a covenant with God how can we be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit and then go our way? Well, there's more to life than that, and that was part of what he was doing for us. Over in the book of John, chapter 14, Jesus, in talking to the disciples, 
prior to his crucifixion. And you can kind of imagine the scenario that was taking place. These disciples that had been with him for about three years really really didn't understand the whole picture, the whole scope of what Jesus was talking about. And I can understand that. I mean, we, we study things, we think about things, and, and we have to deal with that as, as human beings. We just don't sometimes get all of it, and it takes a while to, to come to that point. But he says in chapter 14 that he, he had many mansions in his father's house, and he was going to prepare a place for them. I'm sure they had no idea what he was talking about. <clears throat> um, we have a hard enough time trying to understand what lies beyond. I just know as I tell some people, you know, the other side is a whole lot better than this side, so just prepare yourself for it. And we don't have to know everything. We just know that it's going to be so much better and so much more exciting. But when, when Thomas came to him, and Jesus had told him, he said, you know the way, and Thomas, you know, had this mental block, and, and he said, you know, I, we don't really, really know the way. We don't know what you're talking about. And you can imagine Jesus' frustration in trying to deal with them and try to get this point across to them. He said, he said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to me but by the Father. And he said, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. And then Philip comes up with the good statement. He said, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll understand it. You know, we're like this sometimes. You know, we'll just, just do this, and, you know, we'll get the point. And Jesus said, Have I been with you so long that you have not yet known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And this is the image that we need to truly understand about Jesus, that if you want to know about God, we've got a whole Bible in the New Testament full of things about Jesus Christ and what God is like. You know, we're trying to understand about that image. We're trying to, to develop that image of Jesus Christ because he talked about so many things throughout life as he was living. He talked about the world and how the works of the world are evil. They're wrong. They're not what God expects. Jesus told us that he was the light of the world, that he was the one who was going to show the way and bring the world out of darkness, which we read about in 2 Corinthians, the darkness and the blindness that does exist. And it's there for people to understand and have an opportunity to understand if they just would. And he says over in verse 15 up here, a very simple statement that everybody rejects. If you love me, keep my commandments. A very simple statement. That so many people just throw out the window and say, well, he didn't really mean that, did he? Well, yes, I think he did believe that. When you look in, in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 16 what the apostle said about the word of God about scripture and of what Paul said we throw it off too many times and people so often think about the word of God as, as just kind of being a, a, a book of important sayings to think about and to kind of maybe try to look at occasionally and to read and have a good good thoughts about but it's far more than that second timothy 3 verse 16 all scripture is given by the inspiration of god is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and for instruction in righteousness the instruction in righteousness is important extremely important because jesus was a righteous person and he kept it perfectly he was able to follow it completely with his life when you look at the greek and talk about the scripture as given by the inspiration of God. And it said in the Greek that this particular word of God was breathed. It was God breathed by God himself. Doesn't that sound important? Doesn't that sound like it's something that needs to be thought about and lived in life? When you look back in the Old Testament, and we, we've, known, we've known this from the Ten Commandments movies for years. You know, God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger on tables of stone. Do you realize what that means and, and the impression that's supposed to give us? It means it's important for God to come down here with worthy, unworthy human beings who are worthless, who are physical, who are sinful, 
and he comes down here and with his finger writes in tables of stone the Ten Commandments, I would say that that means that they're pretty important. And yet the world, for the most part, just kind of throws them out. Not necessary. Not needed. Well, we all know that the Apostle Paul did away with them when he said Christ was the end of the law. Well, yeah, but maybe that's not what he was talking about. And yet Jesus was able and willing to take his life and to live his life and to follow these things and to expand on them and to magnify them to the point where they're far more responsible to us today than they were in Old Testament times. The letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. You know, when the Israelites, you know, were sinless just because they didn't kill somebody, that was a whole lot easier than having horrible thoughts about somebody, isn't it? Because that's what Jesus said. Matthew 5, chapter 16 and 17. Turn back there for a minute. You know, when you try to, we could live a whole lot better life if we were living just under the letter of the law. We wouldn't have to worry about being sinful, would we? But Jesus very, very specifically in Matthew chapter 5 explained exactly what he was trying to do, what he was trying to get across. He says in verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. That's a pretty simple statement. But yet, when you encounter most people that are Christians living in this world, they're going to tell you that, that the law has been done away with. Not necessary. I am come, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill in other words, he was coming to validate it. He was coming to complete it. He was coming to witness it to it, to us through his life. Till heaven and earth pass, he said, nothing is going to pass from the law. And he says and, and talks about those who are going to, to change them and say that they're not important, not necessary. But if you go and read on what he was talking about here, in verse 27, he says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, You shall not commit adultery. Okay, that's the letter of the law. That's doing the act. That's, that's important. But I say unto you that whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Does that sound like it's been done away? Of course not. But a lot of people today wish they could have taken that to heart too. It would have certainly changed things dramatically. God's law is a vital part of our thinking and of our conduct as a church and as people and as Christians. And as in society, we need to begin to, to get people and help people to try to see that, that there need to be change that comes along and takes place. Law is a way for a people to be holy to God, to be set apart, to be different, to be special. Obedience to the law generates a divine image in man of what God is and what it means to be holy. The law doesn't give us salvation. The law doesn't bring us life eternal. That has to come through Jesus Christ. But the law is something that helps us to show our loyalty to God and our devotion to God. Because, you see, you and I have entered into a covenant with God through our baptism and our receiving of the Holy Spirit. So does it make any sense to go into covenant with God, to have the Holy Spirit, and then to go about our way and forget everything that we've ever been shown? You know, when Israel came out of Egypt, God, is, and I mentioned earlier this earlier, God had given them a bit of grace by calling them as a people. He talks about it in the, in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Exodus, he says, you, don't, you were not a special people. You were not anything that was that great or that wonderful. You didn't have anything to offer me, but I chose you to be my special people. And he gave them his laws to be an example and also to be a light to the world. And they were going to have a chance for life, a much better life too, physically. God has done the same thing for us. God has called us. God has brought us out of this world, and God has given us his Holy Spirit. And God has brought us in a right standing with him through the death of Jesus Christ. We are reconciled to God. We are redeemed to God. And we can appear before God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And God has given us that chance of life, that chance of salvation as well. Not just a better physical life, 
but of eternal life. You know, Jesus simplified God's law so well when he came and lived his life. I wish we could, we could understand that better and help other people to understand that as we interact with them because Jesus came and, and dealt with a complicated set of God's laws that had been put together by the Pharisees, which got him killed because of his problem of dealing with them. They didn't like it. But he simplified God's law and brought it back to where it was supposed to be. And he truly brought them out of blindness. They didn't like it, though. They really didn't. When Jesus, and what, there's two examples I want to mention to you, and I don't have time to turn to them for the sake of time. And I'm not going to ask if you want me to go on longer because that's happened before <laughs> and winds up being too long. One of those examples is in John chapter 8 where the woman is caught in adultery and taken before Jesus Christ. You know, here it was where the law comes into play, sin comes into play, and then death comes into play as we talked about earlier. Those three elements are there within that particular situation. They caught her. She was guilty of sin, and she needed to be put to death. What was it Jesus said? What was it that Jesus was trying to show? What image was he trying to project of God the Father and how God looks at us as people in spite of our weaknesses? What did he say to her? Go and sin no more. Isn't that what God tells us? As we keep the Passover every year, as we get down on our knees and ask God to forgive us of our sins, what does God basically tell us? If we repent of our sins, we change, we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us for what he's done, for what we've done through him and through his sacrifice, isn't God telling us, go and sin no more? Of course he is. That's what's so important. That, that's one of the projected images of God that we, we need to understand, that, that no matter what you do, you can be forgiven of that sin because of Jesus Christ. And he's trying to illustrate that as God, as to what God feels towards us. So don't ever feel like you're unworthy. We are unworthy to be where we are, but Jesus Christ has made it possible for us. And don't ever forget the scripture that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then people forget to read verse 10, where it says these are things that we should be walking in, we should be doing, we should be following and living by. You know, Christianity is the only religion that has grace. And believe me, when you understand that grace, we can all be very thankful for that because God grants grace to all of us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that particular aspect of God's image is something when we think of Jesus Christ, we can think of God's law and we can think of God because it's for our better, our better interest, our benefit. It's for our, our better health physically and spiritually to keep his law because of what it does for us. Don't ever forget that scripture about grace. For by grace are you saved, not of works. And over the years, I've heard people say, well, they're not going to be in the kingdom of God because they don't keep some particular aspect of God's law. Well, I've heard that for 45 years probably. One, who are we to tell somebody they can't have salvation? Well, that's, that's out because we're not the ones that determine salvation anyway. And, you know, God has given a lot of people forgiveness down through the ages for things that they've done. When I think of King Ahab and some of the things he did and what he was like, pretty bad guy. And yet he repented and God forgave him. So, you know, count yourself in there as well. God will forgive you and will allow you to be forgiven as well. And secondly, works don't save us. Are works important? Oh, you bet they are. They're needed, as James said. Faith without works is what? Dead. But works don't get you salvation, as Paul said. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. 
Romans 5, verse 18. Let's read a scripture there about what Jesus has done for us. I know this is not an easy thought, but we got, we've got to change that image about Jesus Christ and about what he was like because it's, it's far more important this aspect of, of what he was and the image he set because it's so important for people to understand that. Verse 17 of Romans 5, For by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Don't forget that word obedience there. It was by the obedience of Christ and what he did, what he lived, what he was able to do through living a perfect life. I don't think sometimes we can comprehend what it must have been like to be perfect and <clears throat> to not break God's law. What a struggle he went through all of his life. You know, I don't, I don't know that there was ever any question that Jesus wouldn't follow through with what he was doing because he was God, he came down here. Who better understood things than, than God? But he lived the physical life with these physical properties that we have that are not very pleasant at times, are they? You know, the worst thing you can do is go to, go to a class reunion and haven't seen somebody for 40 years and then not, not, not know who they are. It's happened a couple times. You know, you get old, it's not pleasant. It's not fun. And when I went to a class reunion years ago and grew up with most of these students, hadn't seen them for about 25 years. I didn't even know some of them. How embarrassing. And yet, Jesus Christ came down and lived and took on this physical impression that we have and went through life. He didn't live as long as we did, but he lived, you know, a number of years. And he knew what it was like to hurt, to be in pain, to be in mental agony as he did before his crucifixion, which must have been horrible to go through, yet he did. He did it for you and me. Over in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid, how, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I think sometimes Paul's writings are a little bit frustrating and complex because of the way it's worded. I think it would be a, it would be a lot easier to understand it if we were to say here, how shall we that are dead to the penalty of sin live any longer? You know, we are dead to the penalties of sin because of the life of Christ. We don't have to die. That's what the penalty of sin is. It's death. And we are not bound by that. We are not held in captivity, as Paul talked about in, a, in some places, by that anymore. Because of the life of Jesus Christ. But we are not to continue living in sin because we're under God's grace. A lot of people in the Christian world have a hard time understanding that. But it's pretty plain. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says no. No way. Therefore, this talks about the Christian life that we are living. Or verse 3, I missed that. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. And you get into the, to baptism here and the similarities that are striking and showing us what we are doing when we are baptized and going through the th same thing Jesus Christ went through. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like that as Christ was raised from the dead and by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Does that sound like we're, we're supposed to be baptized and live, continue living in the same old life that we were living before? Afraid not. You know, baptism has to do with the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we do in life. We are dead to the past life. We bury it. And we are brought out of that water with the Holy Spirit to walk in newness of life. And that is tough to do. 
And it's a good thing we have Jesus Christ who's able to cover us for the sins that we still make. But we're supposed to be changing and growing and developing, aren't we? That we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, verse 5, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And if God's law has been done away, then why is there still sin? Good question. Which means it's not been done away. Paul, of all people, and you're familiar with this, knew a man who worked on himself day in and day out trying to correct the mistakes and the inconsistencies and the sin in his life. He fought himself day and night, and he worried about becoming a castaway after all he had done because of the, the problem with the flesh that we have the same problem with sometimes. He had to work on himself. You know, I was doing some reading the other night in a book that I read occasionally. Um, <clears throat> it's called the, Dic the Dictionary of Theological Interpretation of the Bible. It's a pretty good book. It gives, it gives a lot of insight into what scholars think about certain topics within the Christian world. You've got to understand some of it. It's not all the best. But there was one statement in there under the topic of law that just about floored me. And here's the quote. Again, the Dictionary of Theological Interpretation of the Bible. No Christian man whatsoever is free from the obedience of the commandments, which are called moral thought that was interesting interesting but yet people don't want to have to be responsible for God's law it's it's just you know not that important we read in Romans 8 verse 7 the carnal mind is enmity against God it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be the the Greek word means an enemy of God the carnal mind is resistant to God it is not subject to God it is the same word used of Satan an adversary that's what our mind is, and that's why we struggle trying to make changes, trying to correct things in our life and having such a difficult time to do because by nature we are not tuned in to want to do what God says. <coughs> if Adam and Eve had made a different decision, just think how much life would have been different for all of us. But that's wishful thinking because that didn't happen. Over in Hebrews chapter 5, conclude here in a couple minutes. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 <clears throat> says, Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that, here you go, don't forget this word, obey him. Why do people think the law's been done away with? It's unimportant. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. So we have a responsibility in life of what we need to be doing. I mentioned before, James talked about faith without works is dead. How can you, how can you show God, how can you tell God that you believe in him, you trust in him, you follow him, if you don't do anything. If after you've been given the Holy Spirit, you want to go your way and do what you've always done. Yeah, we've got to change, and it's not easy to do. You and I know all of that. We've had a lifetime of experience with that. And until we die, we will still be trying to change ourselves with God's help. First Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> He says in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, we have been given the opportunity to understand and, and to see and to not be blinded like the world. Isn't this a scripture from the book of Deuteronomy, from the book of Exodus? Didn't God say the same thing about Israel, that they were a holy people? I think if you read back in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, 
verse 6, you'll find the same terminology here of what God did with his people. He chose Israel. He called them and gave them a specific set of laws to help them. He's called us. He's given us a specific set of laws to help us. But we have the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ backing us up. We've been called out of darkness. We've been freed from the blindness that we were in. And we're able to understand some things that so many people have not been able to understand. Which in time past, verse 10, were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You know, that image of Jesus Christ, who is the one who is the merciful high priest to us, that has given us life and forgiveness and redemption, is truly wonderful. He says over here in verse 21, something that people tend to not want to read and look and think about. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. You know what the Greek means here? The Greek means to trace the letters. When we follow in his steps, we're supposed to trace and do exactly what Jesus Christ did. That's tough, but we're expected to do it and to be different. In conclusion, Romans chapter 12. Paul talked about this in the book of Romans. He says, I beseech you, verse 1, and you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Isn't that what Jesus Christ did? He sacrificed his life. I'm not talking about just dying. I'm talking about, as Paul talks about here, making changes, doing things a certain way, different from the rest of the world, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world don't be like the world is, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. What that means is, is we are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be separate. We are supposed to change the way we are to become more like Jesus Christ. What image, idea, or concept do I want the law to give you next year? I want you to, to look at it and see if you can look at God's law and the image of the Christian life of what we're supposed to be doing and, and see and think of Jesus at that point. Because Jesus, in his image, created all things. He gave the law. He obeyed the law. He did not abolish the law. He lived the law to perfection. He was righteous by the law, which was righteous. He was the perfect sacrifice, as John said when Jesus came down to be baptized, the Lamb of God. The perfect Lamb, not a tarnished Lamb, but a perfect one. And we are to follow in his steps because he was the author of salvation for you and for me through his grace and through his mercy. Hopefully this is the perfect image that you'll think of when you think of God's law. And remember this and share this with people that you come in contact and interact with. And maybe, just maybe, they'll be able to come out of that blindness and see some of the things that you see and understand.